and welcome to the first part of this masterclass on question two from the Cambridge reading paper for IGCSE first language English. So question two tests your understanding of the effect of writer's language. You will see as we work today lots of links in question two to the skills that you've practiced in the literature. You'll use text C, so that's the third article in the exam paper, and the questions, as always, will direct you to particular phrases and passages from that longer article. Now, the first three parts of question two, A, B and C, test your understanding of language and the effects that the writer is trying to achieve. There are 10 marks for this section, and you'll notice they're broken down into lots of small parts. So we need to move quickly through these first three sections in order to get to question 2D, which involves a lot more explanation to show understanding of the effects of language and is worth 15 marks. So most of your marks for question two come from this second section. Today, we're gonna to spend longer on this second section. So we're just gonna briefly look through what the first section is like and to check that you guys understand how to answer those questions. And we're gonna spend more time on question 2D. So for 2A, you're normally asked to select words or phrases with the same meaning. So to do that, you need to read the question very carefully, reread the text, choosing words or phrases which have precisely the same or very similar meaning as the words that are underlined. Question 2B asks you to explain meaning. So it will give you a short passage where some words are underlined and you need to reread the passage, thinking really carefully about the context and explain each word, each meaning using your own words, but in context. So some of these words could mean something different if you look them up in a dictionary. What you're being asked to do is say, what do they mean here in the context of that passage? Question 2C asks you to explain how. So you'll need to reread a short passage, which again, it gives you. Choosing one effective word or short phrase, explaining precisely how that's effective in the context, depending on what the question asks you. And again, it will tell you to use your own words. Question 2D is where it gets interesting. So 2D tests your understanding of the effects of language. And these in the yellow box here are some of the things that I want you to really look out for. How does language create effect? These are some of the ways that language can be used to create effects. So you can almost use this kind of as a checklist when you're reading an article. The use of the five senses, including color, noise, or sound effects. The use of contrast or links between the subject and the environment. So does this person feel very out of place where they are? Or actually, are they loving where they're at? Are there any surprising or unusual words in the context of the description? Do you spot any oxymoron, for example, or words which you'd normally hear used to describe sailing, describing a shopping trip? Look out for any of those surprising or unusual words. And then as the question tells you to do, look out for imagery. So where is the writer find creating vivid pictures for the reader, maybe by using simile or metaphor or personification? To answer this question, you need to reread each paragraph that's mentioned in the question very carefully and highlight any effective phrases or images that you find. Then you can choose the three most interesting phrases from the ones that you've highlighted. Start each section of your answer. So for each bullet point, start like this with a sentence that briefly explains the atmosphere of that paragraph. So like this, the girl's first experience of bullying is described in a terrifying manner. This shows that you understand what the effect is, and then you can go on to explain how the writer has created that. When students follow this structure, they tend to pick up more marks, so that's why we recommend this. Then you need to write in concise sentences, embedding the evidence, mentioning any techniques that you identify, and explaining the effect. So like this, the metaphor towering monster effectively demonstrates how intimidating the bully is to Katie. You can see we've got technique, evidence, explaining the effect straight away. Given your timing on this exam, you cannot write long peel paragraphs for each of these quotations. This is the kind of writing that we're aiming for, nice, concise explanations. OK, so today we're going to work on a question two on this article by Bill Bryson, which is about uh, a seaside resort of Blackpool 
And in it, he is an American who visits the seaside resort and shares his thoughts on the town. He's not very positive in the article. Okay, so I'm going to read this to you and then we're going to work through the questions together. Blackpool, and I don't care how many times you hear this, it never stops being amazing, attracts more visitors every year than Greece and has more holiday beds than the whole of Portugal. It consumes more chips per capita than anywhere else on the planet. It gets through 40 acres of potatoes a day. It has the largest concentration of roller coasters in Europe. It has the continent's second most popular tourist attraction, the 42 acre Pleasure Beach, whose 6.5 million annual visitors are exceeded in number only by those going to the Vatican. It has the most famous illuminations. And on Friday and Saturday nights, it has more public toilets than anywhere else in Britain. Elsewhere, they call them doorways. Whatever you may think of the place, it does what it does very well, or if not very well, at least very successfully. In the past 20 years, during a period in which the number of Britons taking traditional seaside holidays has declined by a fifth, Blackpool has increased its visitor numbers by 7% and built tourism into a 250 million a year industry. No small achievement when you consider the British climate, the fact that Blackpool is ugly, dirty and a long way from anywhere, that its sea is an open toilet and its attractions nearly all cheap, provincial and dire. It was the illuminations that had brought me there. I had been hearing and reading about them for so long that I was genuinely keen to see them. So, after securing a room in a modest guest house on a back street, I hastened to the seafront in a sense of some expectation. Well, all I can say is that Blackpool's illuminations are nothing if not splendid, and they are not splendid. There is, of course, always a danger of disappointment when you finally encounter something you've wanted to see for a long time. But in terms of a letdown, it would be hard to exceed Blackpool's light show. I thought there would be lasers sweeping the strip sky, strobe lights tattooing the clouds and other gas making dazzlements. Instead, there was just a rumbling procession of old trams decorated as rocket ships or Christmas crackers and several miles of poultry decorations on lampposts. I suppose if you'd never seen electricity in action, it would be pretty breathtaking, but I'm not even sure of that. It all just seemed tacky and ad in an inadequate on a rather grand scale, like Blackpool itself. What was no less amazing than the meagerness of the illuminations were the crowds of people who had come to witness the spectacle. Traffic along the front was bumper to bumper, with childish faces pressed to the windows of every creeping car, and there were masses of people ambling happily along the spacious promenade. At frequent intervals, hawkers sold luminous necklaces and bracelets, or other short-lived diversions, and were doing a roaring trade. I read somewhere that half of all visitors to Blackpool have been there at least ten times. Goodness knows what they find in the place. I walked for a mile or so along the prom and I couldn't understand the appeal of it. And I, as you may have realised by now, am, am an enthusiast for tap. Perhaps I was just weary after my long journey from Port My Dog, but I couldn't wake up any enthusiasm for it at all. I wandered through brightly lit arcades and peered in bingo halls, but the festive atmosphere that seemed to seize everyone failed to rub off on me. Eventually, feeling very tired and very foreign, I retired to a fish restaurant on a side street where I had a plate of haddock, chips and peas and was looked at like I was some kind of southern pansy when I asked for tartar sauce. Afterwards took yet another early night. In the morning I got up early to give Blackpool another chance. I liked it considerably better by daylight. The promenade had some nice bits of cast iron and elaborate huts with onion domes selling rock, nougat and other sticky things, which had escaped me in the darkness the night before. And the beach was vast and empty and very agreeable. Blackpool's beach is seven miles long, and the curious thing about it is that it doesn't officially exist. I'm not making this up. In the late 1980s, when the European community issued a directive about the minimum standards of ocean-borne sewage, it turned out that nearly every British seaside town failed to come anywhere near even the minimum levels. Most of the biggest places, like Blackpool, went right off the edge of the turdometer, or whatever it is they measure these things with. This presented an obvious problem to the government, which was loath to spend money on British beaches when there were perfectly good beaches for rich people in Mustique and Barbados. So it drew up a policy under which it officially decreed, this is so bizarre I can hardly stand it, but I swear it is true, that Brighton, Blackpool, Scarborough and many other leading resorts did not have, strictly speaking, bathing beaches. Christ knows what they then termed these expanses of sand, intermediate sewage buffers, I suppose. But in any case, it disposed of the problem without either solving it or costing the exchequer a penny. Which is, of course, the main thing, or in the case of the present government, the only thing. Okay, so now we've read the article, we can have a look at question 2a. 
So what I'm going to get you to do is to write down these four words and then come back to the article to have a look and see if we can find a word which suggests the same idea as the words below. So can you write down these words? Unbelievable eats Europe's yearly. Unbelievable eats Europe's yearly. I'll display this first paragraph. All of these synonyms are in this first paragraph. Can you find a word that means unbelievable in the context? That means eats, that means Europe's, and that means yearly. Okay, if you go to part two, four answers. 